Hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Griggs, and I am the host of the Regenesance podcast. Today, alongside me is Chris Hyatt. He is the president of the American Honeys Producers Association, and he's also someone that's been involved in, in the honey and beekeeping space since birth. Is that correct? That you were raised in this and have been part of um, beekeeping? Yep, sure have my whole life, yep. So I guess to get started, then even before talking about the the Honey Producers Association, um, just talking about childhood from from that, what was that experience like growing up in that environment? Well, yeah, my dad and mom they had six boys, so he had a built-in crew, I guess, and so we all just grew up. You know, a lot of us played football and wrestled, but in the springtime, none of us could play baseball or do anything else because it was busy time because it was time to put bees in and out of the apple orchards in Washington state where we grew up. So we pollinated apples and a little bit of apricots and cherries and it would, you know, get home after school, go, go feed this bee yard, go do this, go do that. And then that night go move bees to Wenatchee, Cashmere, all these different places, and then go take them out, you know, so trucks and forklifts and just a lot of late nights and then go to school the next day. And then our summers were all spent in North Dakota making honey. So, a lot of physical labor and a lot of hard work, but I mean, my dad, that was one of the best things he taught us is hard work and what you can build something from nothing. And the, and the bee, if you take care of, kind of like with rest of livestock, if you take care of them, they'll take care of you. So if you take care of honeybees, you know, you can make a pretty good living. And um, yeah, so I was spent all my summers in North Dakota growing up pulling honey and then school started I go back my usually my dad was there till harvest was done and I didn't see him very much in the fall till he got home and then the bees would go to California and he had managers until we were older that would put bees in and out of almonds and now we have three brothers here and two brothers in Washington doing the apples and we're all uh yep we're a partnership and we run a lot more highs than we used to when we were little kids but yeah it's still busy that's awesome so I guess I have a two-part question because we all know that bees are, are vital for for life. And there's throughout the years, you'll see articles of X amount of bees are dying. And on the there's just all kinds of articles about just bees dying and how that can affect our ecosystem. I wonder if we could just take a step back and paint the full picture of why bees are so important and what exactly they're doing. Yeah, pollination is just a key function that honeybee colonies do in the, in the United States and in our environment. And, you know, one out of every three bites of food you eat is a result of a honeybee. So, you know, that's either almonds, blueberries, apples, cherries, onion, carrot seed, a lot of seed crops need pollination. So you can get that seed to be able to plant in the ground and grow that crop, right? Pumpkins, melons, squash. I mean, you just, it's crazy the list of good food. I mean, our diet would look terribly different. You know, a lot of rice, potatoes, and beans, I guess, and bread, and not the nutritious, healthy stuff that we need in our diet. So, <clears throat> you know, back in the, you know, you go back many, many years, there was a lot more native bees in the environment, a lot more, you know, less urban sprawl, more woods, more open ground, right? More grassland where the native bees could live. But as the years went on and on, you know, DDT and spraying and habitat loss. Now, you know, everybody plants tree row to tree row. There's a lot less area and a lot of those native bees have died. So when you have these big monocultures, you know, a thousand acres of almonds, you know, 500 acres of apples in one spot, you're never going to get the pollination you need. Those bees don't exist anymore. And it's in small cases, yes, if you have areas with woods and you know in an apple orchard probably might get enough pollination just naturally but for the most part commercial beekeepers and then our food supply is highly dependent on honeybees so that requires moving these beehives which are usually four hives on a pallet with forklifts stacked up on trucks all over the country so that's why we go between three different states during the year two for pollination one for chasing honey and you know, 80% of the nation's bees go to the upper Midwest every summer to make honey and recuperate and get strong to go back south. And that's, you know, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, Minnesota. So that's in a nutshell, that's the importance of honeybees. And 
And I would just add, there's been a lot of anti-honeybee rhetoric by other environmental groups, which is really unfounded. And the science is very mixed on that. And you know, between competition between native bees and honeybees. So the importance of our national food supply is important to keep, you know, beekeepers in, in business, getting a fair honey price, not eating adulterated imported honey. So you eat American honey. That's all important to keep beekeepers in business for our national food supply. So there's a couple of good points there. I get for the first one. Could you expand on you're saying that there's some pushback? Um, yeah, I was just curious. Could you elaborate on that? Oh, on the native honey bee side, on the native bee? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's just been some studies that some environmental groups have run with saying that if you have honey bees near natural areas, they'll outcompete and displace your native bees. And there actually was a recent study this last three years by the national, one of the national bee labs out of Logan, Utah, that did some studies up in the mountain of Utah, and they really didn't see competition. They had actually had and, or diseases passed. So this is this is getting published and getting out there, but it's it just seems like they're using it as a talking point to raise money or the low hanging fruit, where actually there's more evidence that livestock is harder on. Like in the Forest Service, there's a lot of permits that beekeepers go up in the mountains in the summer and make honey, and they're starting to take those permits away. That are some of them are 100 years old, multi generation operations that have had honeybees up in the Forest Service. And, but, you know, very, very little science that they're canceling permits and not letting uh, beekeepers run their operations up there. So it's, it's kind of a sad deal, but it's not really based on sound science, what I'm saying. No, that makes sense. And then the second uh, question I had was pertaining to almonds, because with the rise of, I guess, the, the vegan slash plant-based movement and uh, milk alternatives, I mean, almond milk is a huge thing now. And you mentioned the, the monocropping specifically with almonds and apples. Is the monocropping for almonds the, the biggest contributor to um, the decimation of bee population? Or are there other factors that are taken into account for that? No, no. I mean, it, it's it's quite the opposite. The almond industry has been a very big help to the beekeeping, beekeeping industry mm -hmm. because it's very nutritious pollen and it blooms so early in February. So a lot of these hives that are struggling to make it through the winter with varroa mites and viruses, they they can be rebuilt and get stronger faster because the almond bloom comes around, you know, Valentine's Day every year. And, and it's such a big payday for beekeepers to stay in business because it's the largest pollination event in the world. There's nothing bigger than it. There's almost 2 million hives trucked to California to pollinate the almond orchards. Wow. So... It's a nutritious protein, you know, source, and we have nothing against almond milk. And I, you know, I'm not going to get into the politics of the, you know, the dairy industry. If it is, can you call it milk or not? Because we're having the same problem with fake manufactured honey that's grown in a lab saying that it, they try to use the word honey. We don't agree. That's not honey. That's not from flowers collected by bees. So we're kind of in a similar situation. But the almond industry has been, you know, good for us because it's such a, Big event, it pays well, and the bees get strong leaving it. Hmm. So the biggest factors of the bee is the, you know, is the varroa mite, which should not be here. It came from China years ago. It's, we're going 30 plus years dealing with this varroa mite, and the viruses keep mutating and get worse and worse. And that's really taking out a lot of our bee population along with pesticides and habitat loss. I mean, there's a lot of... CRP acres in the Midwest, you know, the conservation reserve program where farmers are paid to put a cover crop in, not to farm, that have gone away. They've gone into corn and soy. So there's a lot of grasslands that have just disappeared. And so the honey production has gone down. We used to produce, you know, three quarters and then down to two thirds, you know, 20, 30 years ago, what all the American consumer eats. But now we're approaching almost a quarter of what we produce is consumed. The rest is all imports. So it just really shows you the loss of the bee loss and the loss of habitat hmm. for forage for bees, clean forage. So on, on the topic of, of chemical sprays with herbicides and pesticides, with the American Honey Producers Association, what's the overall viewpoint? So, because I know there's quite a few members within that organization. Um, is it completely trying to 
not use any sprays at all? Or what's that process look like whenever as the what, beekeepers? Yeah. Our, our group represents, yeah, commercial beekeeper. We're all beekeepers. And we have a pretty good presence in Washington, D.C. And we go every year to Capitol Hill and, and are lobbying for, you know, our efforts and the needs we have. Um, overall, you know, we don't want to take toolbox out of farmers, you know, what they have to use. But if it is doing damage to the environment and to our honeybees, there needs to be some control. And, you know, some of the things in the past about the pro prophylactic use of neonic C treatments where, you know, they'll just use it because it's almost like a you know, rainfall insurance, right? It's like maybe one out of four years, one out of five years, you need it. The other years you were just putting that into the soil, into the environment for no need. Um, and we're not saying to take it away, but there's areas that need it. And there's areas in regions of the United States, you could probably get away with not using the neonic C treatments over and over and over again. They might just, you know, they could save money and also be less hurtful on the environment. But yeah, definitely like the almond board has been really pro, I mean, pro, uh, proactive in helping growers and teaching growers not to like mix sprays, tank mix, because that you, when you mix something with something else, they can hop it up. And they they actually paid for some studies and they had, you know, one study, do not mix tilt with AltaCore because it makes it a thousand times more lethal into bees and stuff. And those kind of things, we've seen an improvement with like the sprays during almond bloom of killing a lot less bees because of just, you know, grower knowledge and, you know, just sharing that from the industry. I'm not saying there's still not issues with fungicides and people mixing stuff in it, even some of the adjuvants, the organosilicones can hurt bees. But yeah, we're not like, we are not the total banned pesticide group. That's not us. We are want to work with farmers, just like we have to use miticides to keep our mites under control in our own beehives. Um, but we want a very, you know, be good stewards, right? In the use of these pesticides. And and just over the years, we've seen a change. I've had calls, you know, especially like in North Dakota for the summer, farmers would call me up, yeah, get your bees out of there and blah, blah, blah. Or, oh, really, I'm just going to spray in the middle of the day. And now I get phone calls like, hey, I'm spraying for grasshoppers or I'm spraying for alfalfa weevil. I'm spraying my sunflowers. They're only 5% bloom. Can I do it first thing in the morning? Can I do it late at night? And those are all great positives. Spraying at night, first thing in the morning is a lot better than in the middle of the day. Or a lot of these farmers are spraying when there's no bloom, when the bees are not present in that crop. So just the awareness is improved of, you know, with pesticides. But there's still pesticide kills each year. And, it, and it's a touchy subject because you have permission to be a lot of our, you know, in the summer, we have permission to all these farmers to put bees on their property. If you have a pesticide kill, you're a little more apprehensive of reporting it to EPA or whatever because you might risk losing that bee yard. So we know there's a lot of pesticide kills that go unreported with honeybees just because I think there's, you know, you don't want to lose that relationship with a farmer. I have yeah. friends and I mean, just from starting the Renaissance and whatnot online, they would be looking for honey that's had no chemical sprays ever used. Is there a way to verify that? Or is that something that you just need to go and visit a local beekeeper and, and have that conversation to really verify? Well, that, that's a complex answer, but um, unfortunately, almost every sample of honey in the United States probably has some, I mean, you're talking very small parts per billion, probably, or two or three parts per million of, you know, Roundup or a fungicide or bees go everywhere. They're flying dust mops. So I've even had some roofing material in a pollen sample come in. I mean, the bees go everywhere, but I mean, there's no levels that are, you're not going to be hurt or anything, but truly organic, it would be somewhere where you, there is no conventional agriculture being used. I know there's like a, maybe one or two places in Hawaii and the high mountain of Arizona. I've heard the rest of the United States because bees fly four to five miles. You don't have enough area where someone's planted, you know, something like a Roundup Ready crop or, sprayed something or you know stuff like that brazil has a lot of the market but we know we've sampled their honey they have just as much as we do of either amitraz you know miticides that you use inside the hive 
or Roundup in the environment because there was farms near it, but they call it organic. The United States accepts other countries' organic standards. Kind of ridiculous, but it is what it is. But um, that's why the organic price is actually cheaper than my white honey price from North Dakota on the shelf. If you go to Walmart. So, yeah. So, they, But I more than anything, getting local honey is the best way to go because then it has your local pollens in it for your allergies. And you know where it's sourced from, right? Where the stuff on the shelf, most of it, if it's product of the USA, you're probably fine. But there's a lot of stuff that's mixed, that's blended between four or five different countries, India, Vietnam, Brazil, Argentina, you know, I mean, they'll blend it. And a lot of my honey used to, my packer that I sell to used to blend it with like half Argentine, half mine and put it in the Costco or the Kirkland brand. And, and, and they have a good honey in Argentina, but there's, we do know like the honey out of China, which we have a tariff on our group, the American honey producers and with the other co there's a co-op United States called Subi. We won in 2001 a dumping suit against China. So there's a tariff on Chinese honey coming in because they, they're way below the cost of production producing it. So they transship to, through other countries to try to you know try not to pay for that that tariff, try to avoid it. Well, in the last two years, we won another dumping suit against India, Vietnam, Brazil, and Argentina. And the same thing. We know that a lot of the Indian and Vietnamese honey, not all of it, but some of it is either resin tech scrubbed that's like you scrub the honey and it's so finely filtered that it really isn't honey by definition after that or there's syrup mixed into the honey and there's even fraudsters online uh, alibaba is the uh, amazon of china they're openly advertising my syrup will pass an mr test the hrms test and so you can so these honey manufacturers are just blending that in with real honey to make it go farther and ship it into our country. And that's what we're fighting against. It's, it's an economic adulteration and literal adulteration. Why, too. why is that such a thing to work? Cause I've, I've bought honey before without looking at the back. And I remember taking it home and I saw the said product of Brazil. It, it, what's the reasoning behind having these from Brazil, China and Vietnam? Is it just purely to have something different or I'm, I'm just curious why those even exist here. <laughs> well, like I mentioned, with all of the habitat loss and the, the amount of hives that are dying, colony collapse disorder, we can't produce all the honey the Americans eat anymore. So we do have to have imports, but we want legitimate good honey imports. And like the honey from Argentina and and Brazil, we haven't there we don't see much adulteration. It's it is it's pretty much fine. I, we we know that the Brazilian honey really is not following the organic at least part of it, not all of it. I'm sure there's honey from the Amazon that really is organic, but for the most part, what we've seen and tested, it's not. But the honey, yeah, if it's legitimate honey, it's fine. But we do know that there's fake, funny honey coming in from, Argen you know, from Vietnam, India, and stuff from China that's transshipped through other countries. We did a report. We had a law office do um, a study on. Uh, other countries around China, like Taiwan, Myanmar, and they've had a jump. Like one year, there was a 500% increase in their honey production. And it's like all the bees are dying across the United States, across the world, and it's harder to keep bees alive. How can you have a jump what, after like a 20, 30-year track record of, you know, 5, 10, 6, 8 mil million pounds, and all of a sudden overnight they have 100 million pounds? I mean, it, it's absolutely just an impossibility, right? So it's just transshipped honey. We knew there's there's syrup mixed in with some of that honey. So so I know, yeah. The battle um, I guess so, yeah. to add to that too, I know this is a loaded question as well. But going back on the topic of just trying to keep up with the the honey production with demand in America, how are we able to, um, I guess, increase America's production of honey to not rely more on these imports is it because i know you've also mentioned with habitat loss so i know that would be a part of it is this also just part of trying to get more people to become beekeepers or what are some bottlenecks in terms of just trying to um bring back the bee population and then also just maintain that population well world war ii we had way more hives i mean because the you know the wax was needed for bullets and stuff and 
just over the years, I can't remember when it crashed, but in the 50s or 60s, that's when we just went way down. And now we're at, I don't know, 2.5, 2.8 million hives, something like that. And we maintain that number pretty close, even with all these losses. But to make up a hive over the winter, you got to take from a strong hive that survived, get a new queen or raise your own queens and make a new hive. And, you, and so you robbing Peter to pay Paul, your your strong hive was not make that much honey that comes that on that upcoming summer because you took in so many bees and brewed away to make a hive, the neighboring hive that died over the winter. So production has gone down just that in general. But we're actively telling people, really, you know, you're not going to save the honeybees by getting a bee yard in your backyard and letting it die. We've over and over again, we've seen so many homeowners get a couple beehives, they put in the backyard and they don't know what they're doing. It's livestock. It's a live animal. They think they can just stick it out there and it'll take care of itself. They're not feeding it, putting pollen supplements. Sometimes you do have to use antibiotics. You have to do mite treatments and it's just a terrible situation. And so that that's not going to save the honeybee. It'd be better to tell landowner, the homeowners, plant gardens, plant, get rid of your grass in your front yard that takes so much fertilizer and chemicals and water and do a habitat. Be, you know, natural native plants, low, like in California, a lot of people are going to the native sages and stuff. And those provide forage for honeybees and native bees. And you're saving water and you're losing less chemicals and you're not using pesticides. So that would be if like a homeowner wise, that would be the best thing. But I mean, we w- we're pushing to get more acres into set aside to see converse conservation reserve or some of these other programs, buffer lands and plots and other things where hunters are, you go hunt on this land instead of everything being planted so much tree, tree row to tree row. Um, that would be one way to get the honey production back up and solving, but the biggest would probably be solving the honeybee losses. I mean, that's, Last year was our second worst uh, year on record. We lost 48% of our honeybees nationwide. So if we can solve that problem and get back down to more historical levels, our 10, 15% loss, you would see a jump in honey production. What you was really the difference would. last year that caused such an increase in, in the decimation of that? Because that is insane. Yeah. Well, we've been running terrible. I mean, it's been jumping in the 30s, the low 40s, the last 5, 10 years. And, you know, the Obama administration really put a big effort in, you know, to try and let's save the honeybee. Let's do, you know, they had highways that you do don't mow until after the bloom and any new federal building would have landscape that's bee friendly. And that that was good that they did that, but it didn't solve really the problem because we still have these high losses in the commercial beekeeping site because the the viruses and the varroa mite is still just getting worse. And we don't have any more new tools to use. We it just, you know, your bears, your Sagentas, your Cortevas of the world, they can't make any money spending millions to develop a new miticide for us because they'll never recoup their costs. We're such a small industry, right? But we really would need more tools in our toolkit to keep the Varroa mite under control and preventing other diseases from coming. There's one in Asia called another mite called the tropi mite, and it's spreading. It's into India, Vietnam, and Thailand. and it is worse than the mite we already have. And if we get that mite in the United States, you know, of course our borders are very porous and that's, we've got all these med flies and the murder hornet that, that came in that made the news. There's stuff coming in almost every day. So if we ever get that one, we're going to be even be worse shape. So we just need more tools in the toolkit to keep healthier hives, to keep our, you know, mites under control, which therefore the so viruses what causes these lower. mites and viruses and diseases in the first place. Well, like mm-hmm. I said, they weren't naturally here. They mm-hmm. got brought in on accident. So preventing that would be the best thing we could do is not let the next mite come in. But just as time goes on, they get more virulent and we just need, yeah, we need more answers to keep the mites under control during the year so we have less viruses and yeah, less problems. There's other diseases too, okay. but that's probably the So I'm going to change topics just a little bit. Um, just for all the listeners, they're just curious to hear about just the process that the whole process of beekeeping, what does that look like from, cause you've mentioned some terms of um, traveling for pollination. Um, yeah. If there's just a, a process for all that, what does that look like? Well, like 
I'll just start in the winter time. All the bees are coming back from North Dakota now. We're unloading bees. You have to you have to unload at night and load at night when the bees aren't flying, so you don't lose all your bees. So a lot of work is done at night or very cold. Like they've already had snow in North Dakota, so you can load during the daytime when it's you know below forty five degrees because the bees won't fly. It's too cold. So we'll be unloading here, big stockpiles for us, semi loading a spot, and the rest of the winter we'll be feeding them uh, pollen supplements. It's like a pound of pollen brewer's yeast and some natural pollen in there. And they'll be feeding them that because we're trying to keep them stimulated. So we didn't have to do that in, back in the day, but to, just to keep brood and keep the queen going so that we don't have, we still have bees come almond bloom in February. Um, Cause there's so many are constantly dying and the population is going down. We constantly replace queens because the queens don't last like they used to they used to last two, three years. Now we barely get one year out of a queen. Every hive you have to have a queen. She lays the eggs, keeps the hive going. So we're constantly diagnosing that. We're doing a mite treatment, organic mite treatment right now, a thymol gel to try to keep the mites under control to clean them up from what we did in North Dakota. The dead outs, we just, which is a hive that has no bees in it, died. We stack them up on a pallet with a forklift we put on the truck. We take it back to the shop. We clean it up for next year to use it again, to kind of scrape, clean off the wax in different places on the honeycomb on the frame, the wooden frame that you don't want, and put them in a box to be ready for March. And then we move all the bees in February, trucks at a time, forklifts into the almond orchard. They'll stay there for a month or two. We get paid for that. Spread out 20 hives or 24 hives of drop all around these almond orchards. And then in the almond orchards, when they're done blooming, we make up the new hives, the first set of new hives. We get queens from Hawaii because they have beautiful weather for mating. We make up a new hive and then take those bees out. We ship probably 10,000 hives to apples to Washington to my brothers. They do the same thing, put them in and out of apples, make up new hives off those hives. Then our baby hives that stayed here, we go to oranges to make orange honey and to get them to build, to be strong, to go to summer for the North Dakota. Then we ship them again, all to North Dakota, which is, you know, with the price of diesel, shipping's expensive. And then we go and we spread them all out in smaller yards, 60, 64 hives through the yard. We put boxes on to make summer, to make honey for the summer called supers. And it's still old fashioned work. When they fill them up in the July, you go for the first time and you break them apart, lift them, carry it. You put a fume board on to get the bees to go down. And then that you put them on a pallet, forklift, list it on the truck, take it to the warehouse, put new empty supers on so they can fill up for August. And then in the the whole extraction process as a whole other process, you have to put it, we call it a hot room in a room that's heated, has floor heat to keep it, you know, 85, 90 degrees. So the honey spins out easier. We, we put it in front of an uncapper, we call it, and the honeycomb goes across, flails, knock the, the wax off so the honey will come out. It goes into a machine, centrifugal force will, for, slowly the computer will have it go around and around until the honey comes out. You spin all the honey out, and you put those boxes back onto in those honeycomb frames back into a box, stack them up to go back out to the bee yard. We do that all summer, and then that honey drains down into a tank. The wax rises to the top. We all stainless steel. We pump it to another set of draining tanks, old milk tanks. It it settles some more wax rising to the top, and we barrel that right into fifty five gallon barrels, just like a barrel of oil big old barrels of honey and we ship that to our packer and they if pasteurize it filter it goes to the store for honey unless it's going to go raw honey there's a big raw honey push where it's not pasteurized anymore it's just slightly filtered and you know the, and that sugared honey is nothing wrong with it. it's actually better better for you better tasting then after that we do mite treatments and more feeding Take the bees back to California to do it all. Over That's awesome. Again. Thank you for explaining. That's kind of my next process. questions are actually going to be about labeling. So I'm glad that you mentioned the the raw versus pasteurized because I eat raw honey and there's this local, I think it's mountain clover raw honey that I feel like Pooh Bear just eating scoops of it. It's so delicious. But if you could just explain, because you're saying that yeah. it tastes sweeter, yep. but it's also a little bit better for you. Uh, yeah, just raw versus pasteurized and why do we have the pasteurization too as well it, it's convenience from years and years it's you know the grocers your safeways your kroger's costco walmart they don't want a bottle that's halfway sugared half liquid doesn't look as good on the 
shelf and then people grandma will come back and say ah something's wrong with that it's convenience right they want to get it be able to pour it be the same so when you pasteurize it it stays for a year or two at that really in between liquid not too hard not too not too soft stage but there is a big push for raw honey because people notice the taste better and it's better to have the pollen in for, in it for you your allergies etc just for health in general and people can put up with having a jar of the sugars that you can just put in a pot of water on the stove for an hour and it'll go back to liquid or heating in the microwave just a little bit. So yeah, we support, I eat nothing but raw honey and it's just, it's just better for you. It, but it's just, there's a convenience and consumer and you know, you know, they get what they want, right? They want a perfect apple with no blemishes, no bruises. Same with honey. They want to be able to pour it just exactly the same. No, that's the partly same why I have, time. I mean, the brand and the podcast, um, because last year was the first time I started visiting farms and, and working. And I remember the farm I used to work on in Pennsylvania, their tomatoes were, they just almost look Frankenstein like, but that's just because I've never been exposed to that. Everything I would see in the grocery stores is the same looking tomato. And so that, that makes a lot of sense for, for honey. Yep. So you mentioned earlier about, um, also kind of fake honey and the push for that. What is the process like for synthetic honey? Because I know going back again to vegans and, and the plant-based movement, there's things called, I think it's unhoney. I think that's what it's called. Um, because I know those, the nutritional value is not even comparable to specifically raw honey. That's why I, there's just so many incredible health benefits for raw honey. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was curious if you could just shed some yeah. light on that whole industry in terms of just the, the synthetic honey. I don't know that industry as well. It's very new. Um, my oldest daughter actually is vegan, but she eats honey because she doesn't believe that. And she, she's a beekeeper. She's worked with me in summers. She's gone to the bee yard with me work that we're not enslaving the honeybee that we're actually good stewards taking care of them, just like a chicken or a cow or whatever. And this honey is a natural product from nature. And, but yeah, the, the synthetic honey, very similar to, you know, in, what is mm -hmm. it called? Impossible meat or impossible burger. And you're beyond me. They're trying to do the same thing in a the laboratory. There's a, I know there's a UC Berkeley startup. There's, a, I think a couple Israeli startups. One's called Mel Bio, but they're just, their talking points and their commercial is yes. The beekeepers are terrible because, we're, you know, you're raping the environment and it's, you know, it's big, you're just, it's just big ag and they don't say anything about the pollination need, you know, that if we got a fair price for honey, it stays us and keeps us in business to pollinate the beautiful food that you love to eat, your strawberries, your raspberries, your avocados and stuff. But um, yeah, that's kind of their talking point. I do not know the process. I know it's just in, in a lab. And I think to try, they're throwing a little bit, I think, some dead bees and a little few, some flower parts to say it is honey. But by definition, it's not honey. I mean, the Codex Elementarius in Europe, it's not honey. Same with the, with the, US, the U.S. Pharmacopoeia standard that just came out. We're still waiting for a standard of identity for honey. <laughs> Excuse me. But um, we hopefully will get this in this farm bill. But no, by definition, that's really not honey. And it's not. You're right. You're getting robbed. Why eat it? There's not, you're losing so much nutritional value and the antioxidants and the natural. I mean, we still don't know what all the wonderful things honey do. I mean, they're using it for cough, Robitussin cough medicine uses buckwheat honey because of the properties. Mm -hmm. Manuka honey is sells for a crazy amount because of the healing properties of Manuka honey. Eucalyptus shows almost the same. They're trying to market that like Manuka honey. They're using it for burn victims, staph infections that 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 have if you have staph and you have the resistance, what is it for some of the antibiotics, whatever for staph, you, they use honey for many different things. So it's you're not going to get that with a manufactured honey in a lab because you're going to be missing the antioxidants, and, uh, a lot of microbes. I remember thinking about like uh, meta honey and they use, I think, Manuka because. So my brother, he had cancer and whenever he was in the hospital, he had 
a lot of surgery on his gut. And so he had just a gigantic essential hole. And they would try to use mena honey to really help with the wound healing. Um, so I guess on the topic of just all of the healing and amazing benefits of raw honey, if you could just talk more on that too for the listeners that might not be aware of just how beneficial raw honey is for us. Well, yeah, I mean, like I, there's a lot of doctors that say, you know, you have ragweed, you have olive blossom, you have all this stuff in the honey that has that pollen in it. And you, by you eating it, you're, it's like you're an immune booster to your system to not to let you have less uh, allergies. And I have a lot of people that want local honey, like my orange honey from California here in California, because it helps with their allergies. Um, there's been other studies of losing weight by having a tablespoon of honey at night and it's called the hibernation diet <laughs> and people do a tablespoon of honey because it's burning. I can't remember exactly, but I think it's burning some of the, your, I don't know. I can't remember exactly. It's kidney or some of the, the fat that you would not have used um, by, by being sedentary. I mean, it'll burn some of the fat that, um, that you can't do while you're exercising or something. But anyways, there's just a lot of health benefits and I don't know them all. But it's just, it's a natural product. It's a, its actually a superfood. You could live, if you had to, you could just live off honey and it sustains life. There's very few foods that's a superfood. And if you just ate that, you would live. I mean, you can, I don't think you can just live off rice. You can't live off, you know, a lot of other things. But it is a superfood because it's so well balanced. Yeah. And, it's, and it lasts forever. That's the another cool thing. They've eaten the honey out of the tombs of Egypt. I've had 50 year old honey. If it's stored in a cool place and it sugars to protect itself, you'll heat that honey up 50 years later. The taste might not be just quite as good as it was 50 years ago. Hmm, I didn't know that. That's nothing awesome. Nothing wrong with it. You can eat it. it doesn't So I'm curious sugar. then, because you were raised into beekeeping and all things bees, and now you're, you're the president of the Honey Producers Association and you have your own um, Hyatt Bee Co. What has, what's, I guess the biggest reason why you're so involved with this, especially throughout your whole entire life versus everything. I mean, agriculture, there's so much that you can do. And so I'm curious, what's made you stay in the, the world of bees and beekeeping? Well, I enjoy it. I mean, it's, I don't think I could have had an office job every day, every day, day in, day out. I like to be outside, be active. And it's, it's something different almost every day. Sometimes you're paying farmers yard rent for, you know, having bees on their property and you're talking to them, giving them honey, giving them almonds, and it's fun. Sometimes you're in the truck. I like to listen to podcasts and like yours. And I do a lot of driving. I get to listen to podcasts and see some beautiful scenery. But and sometimes it's physical labor. You work with my my son or my daughters by lifting hives and I lose weight every summer because it's hot and it's physical work, right? So it's something different almost every day and it's a lot of different problems to solve. The beekeeping industry is, has a lot of problems to solve, but it's like almost becoming like a plumber or apprentice, you know, apprentice electrician or, you know, painter. There's a lot of nuances and a lot of things you have to get to know over the years and you can only find out and become experienced by doing it. Um, and then just being involved with American honey producers, I just saw there was a need and I was asked to be on the board and I just see, I'd seen what the impact they have had in the past with dumping suit and getting the price of honey up and emergency payments for beekeepers and rainfall insurance and labeling laws and just things that you don't think are fair. You have to be at the table to be heard in Washington, DC, unfortunately. <clears throat> and sometimes the government won't do things out of the, and you know, like working with customs to get honey tested. We, we were working with customs to get some new honey testing to prevent some of this fraud from coming in. And that was our group. And, myself and the previous president before me going to DC and, and just being heard and making high level meetings. So it's, it's cool being involved that way. I don't get paid for it. I pay for my flight there and back, but it's, I just see it as a worthwhile um, endeavor, I guess. And it, it's been rewarding over the last few years doing it. I just see it's a, yeah, so that's, it's a, there's a problem. The last topic to that I wanted against. to talk about was the American uh, Honey Producers Association and I'm assuming because you were talking about it, what was the catalyst behind forming that? Was that to give the voice for the beekeepers and like you're saying, talking with, with Congress in D.C.? Yeah, yeah, it was. 
<laughs> over 50, whew, 55 years ago or something, there was one organization in the United States and the other group, the Federation, they kind of stayed with the Packers and had more hobbyists and they didn't want to take on some of the bigger problems. So my dad was actually at the meeting when they separated and the honey producers was kind of formed to really take on some of these big problems that have a focus of the profit minded beekeeper and how do we stay in business and be proactive in DC and be, get our problems solved and being heard. And that's kind of the genesis of the American honey producers and how it's kind of evolved and it's all volunteer, but there's been a lot of good people before me and hopefully there'll be a lot of good people after me to keep the thing going because we have, a really good presence and we have a lot of champions on Capitol Hill that have done good work for us because they see the value of beekeeping to just the farm gate, the billions of dollars of farm gate value of the crops pollinated. And it's a lot of it's dependent on us keeping, staying in business and, and just, you know, yeah, if you're not at the table, you might, you're not going to be heard. And that's kind of in our philosophy and, you know, we, we've worked pretty hard over the years at it. It's, we're not perfect. And there's a lot of problems you can't solve that we've tried for many years with EPA and updating pesticide labels and preventing some sprays from being sprayed or, but it, sometimes you're just banging your head against the wall when you're up against, you know, the government, which is a big bureaucracy, but there you can see, and I've noticed there's a lot of young people in DC that are sharp that still do care. They're behind the scenes writing bills writing into bills into law and there's still good people there. So I still have faith. Do you have an example you could provide of <laughs> so, yeah. issues with the EPA and, and labeling around pesticides? Um, well, we've had representative of ours. I have two friends, actually my vice president and the, one of our past president before me used to be on a pesticide dialogue committee for years and years. And it just seemed like it would not go anywhere. They would air concerns and, we would not like to see this. We have issues with dicamba or there's like in Arkansas, what if there's my vice president, Stephen Coy, I mean, they, they used to run, they're the biggest beekeeper in Arkansas and they almost left Arkansas. They have very few in Arkansas. Now they went to Mississippi because the dicamba spraying was so bad. They were killing everything along the fence line. That was where the only thing blooming they were making honey on and, and losing bees to dead on sprays by dicamba. So, I don't know. There's, there's been, there's been some work I've done with other groups like the Honeybee Health Coalition, Polyer Partnership, nonprofit groups that are trying to curb the use of pesticide or do it in a better judicious way that, you know, we've had uh, management guides for soybean growers, canola growers, and it talks about using pesticides judiciously. Be careful when honeybees are there and you really need to use this pesticide. And, you know, and there was a study you know, that the EPA came out with and USDA supported about, is there really value in neonics? It doesn't. And we thought that was going to be included in the very first soybean management pride, management guide. And they wanted, the USDA wanted to take it out. And we we're like, well, you, you agreed with us last year. Now I think, you know, there's pressure from big chemical and, and, and you know, they're needed, but they're, they're, I think there a part of the frustration is that it seems like there's a revolving door at EPA of big chemical people coming in, working with EPA and going back out, coming back in. And I don't know if that has the, the environment, beekeepers, and actually the best interests of farmers at heart, or is it more bottom line? Cause I mean, there's a lot of bottom line for farmers. Cause you know, there's, especially like the price. I also grow almonds. We grow apples and I've seen the price of almonds drop. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to do another mite spray in the summer, but it ain't, get, you know, to get what? To save five, 10 cents when the price is so low. And, but, you know, some people, and, you know, I've had a PCA in the past that wasn't independent. He was a chemical guy for the company. And he would, a lot of it, he would just, because the calendar said so, I'll spray. And I, luckily I found another independent PCA that's like, no, it's real life conditions, county, naval orange worm in your orchard do you really need to spray or is it not be is below the economic threshold so that's the kind of thing we push for is like don't just spray because it says on the calendar or your chemical rep or your agronomist says oh yeah throw that in there you maybe do a little science do a little bit of work and study on your own just because you know just to spray to spray is not you know economically <laughs>
and advantageous to your operation How besides the environment. Could Americans honeybees? better support folks such as yourself and others within the beekeeping space? Well, buy American honey. Try to buy local honey. Don't buy foreign honey. Um, don't feel like you need to get a beehive to save the bees. Get rid of your grass and do native landscape. Those would be some good things. And then if they if they if they are inclined, they can donate to American honey producers on our website. <laughs> We will put those funds to good use trying to keep honeybees alive and keeping beekeepers in business. So, yeah, it's hpanet.com. Awesome. But you can just um, Google I guess is there any other websites or anything on social media up. that you would like to add? No. Well, we have a Facebook presence, too. Awesome. But, well, thank um, you so much, Chris, for joining us. It's really great. That, I think and, we covered it. Um, I know I learned a lot, and I know other listeners will, will definitely learn a lot. No, I appreciate it. I, we, I've got some regenerative farmers in North Dakota that do the crop rotation and I, I support them a hundred percent. I think that's, you know, there was a, there was a, a friend of our, our association that was fired from his position really? in South Dakota with USDA because he was a little too vocal on Neonex. And now he has his own farm and is doing a lot of research into regenerative farming, crop rotation and, you know, he doesn't plant the same crop on his farm like every seven years. That ground will see that crop. I mean, it's a really good dynamic. He's doing a lot of interesting thing with honeybees, with livestock and mm -hmm. root crops. But anyways, yeah, regenerative farming, that get back to our roots, right? Like the Native Americans, you know, <laughs> that's what we need instead of corn, yeah, corn, I mean, corn every year and West, stuff like that. Yeah, crop Our rotation, family, we're all whenever we take vacations, is always on the road. And as a kid, I was always just yelling corn, 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 because that's all we saw for hours. <laughs> but yeah, that's all you see.